Welcome to The Positioning Show, where we discuss topics related to the practical application of positioning for marketing, sales, and product teams. I'm April Dunford, a consultant, author, and the world's leading expert on positioning for B2B technology companies. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of The Positioning Show. It's book launch week. Finally, it's book launch week. It feels like I've been thinking about book launch week for years. And in fact, I have. And finally, it's here. So yeah, my new book is launching this week, officially available. It's called Sales Pitch. I thought what would be good to do on today's episode is just talk a bit about the book and why I wrote the book and where the idea for the book came from and what I think you should be able to do with the book. So yeah, I think this is going to be fun. So here we go. So uh, my background for the past seven, eight years, I've been a consultant. Before that, I was a repeat vice president of marketing in a series of startups. But the past seven, eight years, I've been a consultant and my focus has been positioning. So my first book called Obviously Awesome was a book about how to do positioning, like a methodology for doing it. For the past seven, eight years, I've been working with high growth tech companies. They're all B2B. They all have a sales team. They're all fairly complex products. And there's two things that I do with companies in a positioning exercise. The first thing is we do positioning exactly the way it's laid out in my first book, Obviously Awesome. And what we do is we get a cross-functional group of people together and we work them through the component pieces of positioning in a very specific order. The second thing that I do with companies in positioning workshop is we take that positioning and we translate it into a sales pitch. There's a reason that I do that. At the beginning, when I was working with customers, we were just doing the positioning piece and we weren't doing the sales pitch piece. And what I found out from doing a handful of those projects was that that was a disaster. It was really bad. <laughs> and it was bad because we'd get to the end and everybody in the room intellectually would understand, yes, this is who we compete with. This is the value we can deliver. No one else can. This is the definition of an ideal fit customer. Marketing would be happy. They would take the positioning and as a component piece of the positioning was differentiated value. So they would use that as the, the centerpiece for messaging. So I understand what my differentiated value is. I understand who I'm trying to communicate that to. So now I can go build messaging and they, you know, off they go. Marketing team's really happy. On the sales side though, intellectually sales would understand, yep, yep, this is the value and this is who it's for, but they weren't always sure how to pitch it. And so I would have this issue in that we'd be working on positioning and everybody in marketing would be happy, but then it never survived the jump from marketing to sales. And so what sales would do is intellectually, they would understand that the positioning has changed, but they would still keep using the old sales pitch, you know, and then there'd be some sales pitch cobbled together since the dawn of time. They would have some you know, a couple of slides about the company background, some slides about current customers. You might have a case study. And the bulk of the sales pitch was a product walkthrough. So here's all the features, customer, you figure it out. And so not a lot of positioning was going on on the sales side of the house. And so it struck me that, hey, if we're going to get positioning and make it stick, we're going to have to do the sales pitch too. So in the, in the clients that I worked with, we did the positioning and then we also did the sales pitch. The thing that I recognize we started doing that is often the sales pitch was a big unlock and not just for sales. It also was an unlock for marketing that was like, oh, this is actually how we tell the story. It was kind of an unlock for folks on the team that had to go back and communicate it back to their teams. You know, how do we actually tell the story? So I decided that this sales pitch thing was a critical piece of positioning. We couldn't do positioning without doing the sales pitch bit. Now, when I wrote Obviously Awesome, I had the idea that we already knew how to do a sales pitch. Like companies are sending their salespeople to sales training. And as part of that sales training, I assumed would be how to do a sales pitch. But here's where things get kind of funny. Like one of the things I've recognized in tech companies is it's a bit foggy who actually owns the sales pitch. And so if you go to sales, they'll be like, well, we kind of get some of this stuff from marketing. We don't necessarily like the stuff we get from marketing, but we kind of get some of it from marketing. And sometimes product management is helping us figure out a demo and what that should look like. And sometimes we'll actually pull someone in from product marketing or product management to do the demo for us. But we're not actually the people that build 
the pitch itself. In marketing, if you go talk to marketing, often they'll say, well, yeah, we're responsible for building the pitch, but nobody listens to us. <laughs> like we build the pitch, we throw it over the wall, sales complains about it. And, you know, sometimes bits and pieces of it will survive, but, but there'll be this tendency for the salespeople to fall back into the old pitch that they're comfortable with. So I made a lot of assumptions in the first book about who owned the sales pitch, who was going to build it, how that was going to work. Like I knew how it worked in the companies where I worked, but I guess I thought other companies were better at this stuff. And so it became clear to me that there was value in teaching people how to take positioning and translate it into a sales pitch. So I started doing it as part of the work I did with clients and that forced me to get better at teaching my sales pitch structure. I'd like to talk a little bit about where that sales pitch structure came from, because I think it's really important. Like it's important for you as folks out there that are wrestling with this stuff and trying to figure out, is this structure for me? And because I think there's lots of ways to build a good sales pitch and this is not the only one. So here's where mine came from. So um, I, I've told this story before, but I, I got a job at IBM. Before I was at IBM, every sales pitch that I worked on, we, we never started from scratch. Like it was always an evolution. There was a bunch of slides around. We might add some stuff to it or take some stuff away, but we never threw out all the slides and built a completely new pitch, even if we were doing new positioning. And the structure of that pitch was some variation of problem, solution, you know, who we are, here's a bunch of customers, please pay us the money. Now, there were obvious things that weren't great about that. The bulk of the sales pitch was a walkthrough of the product. Like, we're going to show them how to log in. If there was nine drop down menus, we're going to walk through all nine, we're going to show them all the stuff. And then we were going to try to convince them that like, we're not really a small company with three guys in a basement, even though sometimes we were, <laughs> but, 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 you know, we'd say, look, we got all these nice customers and let me give you a case study and please buy from us. So that's what I always did. And I never really thought that there was anything more to it than that. And then I went to IBM and, it, and at IBM, I learned a different sales pitch structure. Now the sales pitch structure at IBM was very particular to IBM. And, and it, it baked into that structure was a bunch of assumptions. So one was, there was assumption that this was a giant deal. Like most of the deals that folks worked on at IBM, this is back when I was there, so I'm sure it's different now. But back when I was there, these deals are big, big deals, like tens of millions of dollars, not unusual for us to be working on a $100 million deal that crossed a whole bunch of product lines. And so these deals are not little things, like they're deals that are, you know, the the sales process takes more than a year. We have a very long time to work with a customer and get into things. And so there was a way that the first pitch deck was structured. And a lot of it assumed that we got this giant deal. We got all kinds of time. We're going to have millions of meetings before this deal closes. And at the beginning, I didn't understand the sales pitch structure that IBM had. I thought it was stupid and it was overkill. But I had never worked at a company that was doing deals quite that big. But after a while, I sort of understood the genius of it. And there were a handful of things that I thought were very good that kind of transcended IBM that I thought would be good to do in any company. And so but one of those things was they always started with some kind of market insight. So they didn't start with the problem. They started with something that only IBM could talk about. So they would start with, you know, we're IBM and we look at the problem like this in this market space. And, you know, because of that, that's informed the way we've built products. And they would have a long discussion about that. So that was the first thing. The second thing is that never in a, in a first call would we ever talk about features, like almost never, like that we were talking about value. We might talk about features, but never outside of the context of value. There was always, we can help your business achieve this. And then if we got into features at all, it would be in the context of this, this is how we're going to do that. So those two things I thought were really interesting. Now, if you scratch at that a little bit, IBM didn't make this stuff up. It came from, as far as I understand, consulting engagement they did with this company called the Corporate Executive Board. Corporate Executive Board is, is, was very, at the time, very famous sales training folks. 
that were best in class and all big enterprise companies were using them at the time. And the, the claim to fame, Corporate Executive Board wrote a couple of books. The main one that you would have heard of is called The Challenger Sale. Challenger Sale came out in 2010, 2011. I think, you know, I was at IBM before that, but they had worked with IBM. Challenger Sale was based on a bunch of research that was done by the Corporate Executive Board around what works and doesn't work in with, with salespeople. And, you know, what do the best salespeople do in a sales process versus what do not high performing salespeople do. And so from that research, they came up with this book, The Challenger Sale. In The Challenger Sale, if you read that book, there is a, a structure for a first call. I actually have the book sitting right in front of me. Here it is, Challenger Sale. And if you go to page 66 in The Challenger Sale, there's a little graphic in there. I'm going to show it to you if you're on the video. It looks like this, but it's page 66. You can, if you go on this book, you can go look it up. But in there, there's something called deconstruction of a commercial teaching pitch. And it, it, in here was a bunch of genius stuff in there. So there was this idea of you know commercial teaching, which was the pitch is going to start with this insight that you have that you know something about the customer's business that they don't necessarily know. Now, in the context of IBM, we were doing these giant, giant deals selling mainly into IT departments. So you got to imagine if we're coming in to sell like a hundred million dollars worth of software, like your budget's already dedicated to other stuff. Like we have to convince you to stop doing something gigantic. <laughs> it takes a hundred million dollars and apply it to this other thing. And so the, generally we would have to go in there and kind of blow your mind about something and go in and say, you are really looking at this thing wrong. There's this other thing. And there's a stage in typical challenger sales pitch. And we used to do it at IBM. There's a stage where you make this, you make this statement where you say, look, this is our insight. And it's so big and so different that the customer is sometimes kind of pissed at you, but, but generally sort of looking at you and saying, well, that can't be right. You know, because if that was right, we're, you know, we're doing a hundred million bucks worth of stuff wrong. <laughs> and then there's a phase that the, the challenger sale calls rational drowning. And so the rational drowning phase is where I hit you with the overwhelming evidence that what I have just challenged you with is true. So in the case of IBM, we literally had a huge department of people that were doing research and looking at this stuff. And, and this department was cranking out all this empirical evidence to support the sales team in doing this rational drowning thing. So the customer would say, well, that can't be true. And we'll say, actually, yeah, it is. Here's a study. Here's a study. Here's another study. Here's another thing. Here's an interview we did with a customer and we drown you. Like we're going to, we're going to kind of like, you know, pummel you into submission <laughs> on this thing. Now, if I'm doing a hundred million dollar deal and it's going to take me a year and a half to close it, I could technically spend the majority of a first call challenging you and drowning you with the rational stuff. And then kind of, you know, maybe at the end, give you a flavor for don't worry, we've got a solution. Like if you're starting to have a, oh no moment in this thing, like here's what we think we should do instead. And this is the value we can deliver and whatever. And this is the back half of this challenger sales pitch. And so I went from being quite skeptical about this pitch structure to being a big advocate of it towards my time at, at the end of my time at IBM. But, and this is, where, this is where the but comes. So why don't I just use challenger sales pitch structure in a sales pitch? And here's why. So I left and I went to, I was living in New York at the time and I moved back to Toronto and I joined a company called Data Mirror. And Data Mirror was not IBM, smaller company. And the big difference was our average deal size was quite a bit smaller. So our average deal size was less than 100K. So it's a long way from 100 million, less than 100K. And when we started thinking about this idea of I'm going to come in, I'm going to challenge your belief on something, the first thing I noticed was most of the time, if you thought about our insight into the market, it wasn't all that challenging, to be honest. Like it was generally a, just a slightly different perspective. And it wasn't that hard once we brought it up to convince the customer that it was true. Like it was generally something that they just weren't thinking about. So in, in the case of Data Mirror, we were coming in and, and saying, look, like the way you do like hot failover and hot backup, essentially information integration is kind of inefficient. 
And in an emergency situation, like you have all these problems and a better way to do it would be if you had a tool that could do this other thing. And most of the time our customers would be like, well, yeah, that'd be awesome. We, we get it, but that tool doesn't exist. And we'd say, oh, well, it does now. Let me show you how we do it. And so our challenging phase of this challenger sale pitch actually didn't have to be all that challenging. It was just a little bit of like blink it on the flashlight and pointing it in the right direction and having the customer go, oh dear, never really thought about it that way. So that was the first thing is I didn't necessarily have to spend a lot of time in the challenge phase and I didn't necessarily have to completely rationally drown you. I had to, I had to come with the facts, Jack, but I didn't have to kind of drown you with it. And it certainly wasn't going to take up the whole first meeting to do that. And so that was one of the big differences I found right out of the gate. The second thing was that the customers in a smaller deal, we're expecting to close these pretty fast and we needed to get to the meat. Like we needed to get to the, not just, Hey, you know, we're th we think about this in a different way. And, and do you agree? And the customer says, yes, but then we had to show them the guts, right? Like, so here's the value we can deliver and here's how we do it. Like we had to actually get into product in a first call because, you know, we might close a deal in one call or two calls or three calls, not 18 months worth of calls. So what, what ended up happening for me was I essentially took, like, I started with something that looked like, you know, sort of challenger-ish and then modified it for you know, a situation where the deal size was smaller, the sales cycles were shorter. We didn't really have to challenge the customer so hard, but we did have to come in with unique insight. Otherwise we, we'd sound like everybody else. And we had to give a demo and show them stuff, but we wanted to orient that around differentiated value and not just have it be, you know, a feature function wind tunnel and leave it to the customer to figure out why those features were important and why they mattered for them. So, so this kind of unlocked a thing for me there. So I started there with what I would call sort of a startupified version of that IBM pitch structure that I had learned. And then over the next, I don't know, I guess 10, 15 years more of me being a VP marketing, I brought that pitch structure with me. And every time we, I went to a new company and we had to work on sales pitch decks, I'd be like, hey, I have a structure. And everybody was kind of like, oh, like we've never actually done the sales pitch from scratch. And so I said, well, look, we're, we're working on this positioning. We should make sure the sales pitch matches the positioning. So we should actually throw the sales pitch out and start from scratch. And people were generally like, yeah, okay, never done that before, but yeah, okay, let's do that. And then everybody said, well, how are we going to build it? And I say, look, I have this structure. And so that structure evolved over time. Like the things that worked at Datamir did not work at the next company I went to. And there were a stream of companies after that. And so there's this thing that happens when you, you know, you take this structure and you apply it to different companies and, you know, different pricing models and different go-to-market models. And so I'd been fooling around with this structure forever. When I switched to doing consulting, I, at the beginning, again, I didn't think I had to teach people a sales pitch structure. I thought we could just stick to positioning, but then it was clear positioning without the sales pitch structure was going to be a disaster. It was never going to make the jump over to sales. And I thought I would get pushback. So I thought that, you know, when I came into these companies, there'd be somebody over in sales that would say, no, 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 we don't do it that way. You know, we learned something else in some other sales training or whatever. We don't like that structure. And so at the beginning I'd come in and I'd say, look, we can use any structure you want. So do you have a structure? If you don't, then we can use mine. And even if we use mine, you don't have to stick with it. We just need a structure if we're going to work on a pitch together. And interestingly, you know, over the course of working with a couple hundred clients, only a couple of clients I ever worked with had a structure that they were using and they liked. So that was news to me. That's kind of the background of this thing where it came from. So then I started teaching it to clients because we needed it. And again, we needed a structure at different times. Like originally I didn't want to get into the sales pitch business, to be honest. Like, you know, I'm the positioning lady and I'm like, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if it's my place to teach sales pitches. And I kept hoping that there was a good sales pitch structure out there that I could just point people to and say, okay, we've got the positioning now. Just, you know, didn't you just use this thing to build the sales pitch and nothing ever worked. So 
There were some that had interesting aspects to it. About 10 years ago, there was a blog post that floated around and it was called the greatest sales pitch I've ever seen. And this was a neat structure that, that people were using or attempting to use for sales pitches. The interesting thing about it was there were things I liked about it and things I didn't. So the things I liked about it was that it was not oriented all around features. So I liked that. I liked the idea that it was trying to start with some kind of a point of view, but then there were so many shortcomings of it that most of the time it was impossible to use. So the structure sort of does this thing where there's an old way of doing something and there's a new way of doing something. And so what you do is you kind of position everything else as the old way. And then you say, well, we're doing this the new way and the new way, uh, you know, unlocks all this value in this new world, you know, and, and usually it talks about there's a trend that's driving everybody to the new way and it's going to unlock all this value and oh man, you're going to be in big trouble, you know, and there's this kind of FOMO bit in this pitch where it says, you know, everyone's doing it and all the successful companies are doing it. So if you're not doing it the new way, you're a loser. And then there's this bit where they sort of say, you know, the features, we get to the features, but it's like, there was this really funny messaging around it. It was like, your features are like magic gifts that unlock the value of whatever. And so I could see this pitch structure working in a, in a certain kind of a company for a certain kind of thing. So I don't doubt that it works in some cases, like particularly where it's kind of a wide open market. Like you don't have a lot of competitors, direct competitors. You're only competing against the status quo and, and the status quo is some old junky thing, right? Like some legacy software or doing it by hand or whatever. And you're the only new thing. What I found in a lot of the companies that I worked with is there was a status quo thing and and definitely to win a deal, we had to do that, but there were also multiple new things. So we had to convince the customer to get off the status quo, but we also had to beat anything else on the short list. And often the other things on the short list were also new. So, you know, we couldn't just say we were the new thing and a customer would come and say, well, actually these guys are newer than you. So are you saying they're better because they're newer? That was the first problem. Second problem was there was no concept of differentiated value. So in that sales pitch structure, there was this idea that new is value all on its own. And I do think that there are certain kind of markets and certain kind of early adopters that just want to do the new thing for the sake of doing the new thing. But a lot of times what we have in B2B, especially big ticket, B2B, new is actually not necessarily super valuable. Like new is sometimes means risky or unproven or, you know, buggy. <laughs> and so we couldn't just rely on, hey, do this because it's the new thing. We actually had to prove the value. Like what is the business value of the new thing? What is this new thing going to unlock for your business? And so so that didn't work for a lot of the clients I was working with. We couldn't just say, oh, it's new, therefore you, you should buy it. And, you know, and I'm inherently suspicious of anything that isn't oriented around differentiated value. Like I truly believe that differentiated value is the answer to the question, why pick us over the other guys, including the status quo. And if you can't get really tight on articulating your differentiated value, then that's just not a good sales pitch. What it is potentially and what I really liked about that structure is I started pointing people at that blog post and saying, that's actually a really good VC pitch structure. Like if you wanted to raise money, it's a good way to do it because, you know, in a VC pitch, the timeframes are longer and you are kind of relying on there being a big upheaval in the market that's going to displace the status quo and you're going to come in and capitalize on that. And venture capitalists have a different time frame, so they're often not so worried about the immediate competitors. And if you can make a compelling case that says, hey, everything's the cards are all going to get thrown up in the air because of this thing, and we're going to merge as this you know, victorious solution that pops out of that, I actually think that's a really good way to build an investor pitch, but not necessarily what you want to do for a sales pitch. I couldn't do exactly challenger sale, although I could borrow a lot of the good stuff out of there. And I, like, I still think that that sales pitch structure, that anybody that's doing sales pitches, I think it's a good idea to go back and read that book and look at it and understand that and figure out whether or not that's for you. And I think there's so much gold in that book that everybody should read that anyway. I think there are potentially edge cases where you could use some of these other pitch structures that maybe look a little bit more like an investor pitch or a VC pitch, but I didn't see anything that looked like a structure that we could really use for a sales pitch 
for a company that, you know, had a shorter sales cycle and wasn't doing multi-million dollar deals. So my pitch structure is the answer to that, hopefully. So the way the pitch structure works is there's kind of two big sections. There's a setup and a follow through. The setup is very much this idea. We're starting with our insight. What's neat about that is the insight is unique to us. Nobody else has the same insight on the market as we do. So we're not just simply talking about a trend that any other company who recognizes that trend can talk about. We're not talking about a problem that potentially all of my competitors, including the status quo, could potentially solve that problem. We're certainly not starting with features. Instead, we're starting with this insight that only we have. We look at the market, the situation, the job this way. The second thing we do in the setup is we paint a picture of the entire market for the customer. We know from the research, and if you haven't read Matt Dixon's new book, The Jolt Effect, there's a bunch of really neat research in there that basically says a lot of the deals that we lose to, it appears that we lose it to status quo, but we're actually losing it to no decision. And the guts of that no decision is that a customer can't figure out how to make a good risk-free choice, so they decide to do nothing. One of the ways we can help get around that is to paint a picture of the whole market so that the customer can basically put different vendors into different buckets by their approach to the problem. So this is actually a really important thing to know. We are not competing against competitors, we're competing against approaches. So we start with our insight, and then we say, well, let's look at the different approaches and the pros and cons of the different approaches. This is also a great way to do discovery. So it allows us to work discovery into the sales pitch in a very natural way. And then it allows us to do step three, which is this step where we get alignment between the customer and us on our point of view of the world, where we say, look, like if we understand this about the problem and looking at what works and doesn't work in with the different approaches to the job, can we agree that a perfect solution would tick these boxes? Now, this is a really important step in the sales pitch. It's where we're getting agreement on purchase criteria, really, but we're kind of getting agreement on our point of view on the market where we say, look, like, have we made a good case for this? Like, do you agree that if a solution existed that ticked these things, that would be a good way to go about it? If we've done our job well up front, the customer says, yeah, yeah, if that existed, man, I would love that. Then we switch to the meat of the presentation, which is, hey, here's us and here's how we do that. So we deliver this value, here's how we do it. We deliver this value, here's how we do it. We deliver this value, here's how we do it. This upfront setup piece, I've seen companies do this in as little as a minute, a minute and a half. I don't think it should take more. It's If you have 45 minutes, it shouldn't be taking you more than 10. Like customers are going to get frustrated. We got to be careful that we're not noodling around with our insight all day because we just don't have that time. But I think that we could get through it in a couple of minutes, five minutes max. Then we're moving on to value, which is the bulk of what we want to talk about in a first sales call. Like this is the value we can deliver. Here's how we do it. Then, you know, there's usually some stuff that happens at the end, which is we usually have a proof step where we say, look, this is the proof that we can do what we say we can do. Often that takes the form of a case study. Sometimes it's third party stuff. And then there's an optional step that is for handling objections. So the customer is sitting there saying, well, that all sounds good, but I don't think we can afford it. Or that all sounds good, but I don't think my you know users are ever gonna adopt that. That sounds too hard to roll out and there's too much change management. And you can say, hey, like, you know, we actually have a professional services team is gonna help you like this. We have onboarding help and this is what it looks like. We do our own training, it looks like this. Hey, this is our pricing structure. And even if you don't wanna give them a price at this point, you could sort of walk them through how the structure works so they can get a ballpark figure in their mind and go, oh, actually, that's not so bad. We could be able to afford that. And then the last step of the sales pitch is the ask. We don't want to leave without being clear on what happens next. So that's the structure in a nutshell. Now, I do think, and I have seen companies use different structures from this. Like, I think that, I think there's a lot of good ways to do a sales pitch, to be honest. But what I'm hoping that this book does is it gives you a starting point to at least start thinking about 
something different than the product walkthrough that your sales reps today are likely using or some other structure that you've been using if you're frustrated with it. I think my book gives you just another structure to look at to say, hey, we could steal this, we could steal that, we could slam it together. Here's things that could work and here's things wouldn't. So I'm super excited to get this book out. Like I, you know, it's funny, people were bugging me about the title, like it's called sales pitch. People were like, well, I like the title in your last book better. It was so much cooler, you know, obviously awesome. And I was like, people, the first book was about positioning and I wanted to call it positioning, but I couldn't because there was a book already that existed that was called positioning that everybody's already read. And my book was like that book, but the way to do positioning. So instead I had to call it something else. And I don't know how I came up with obviously awesome, but that's where it was. With this one, I was like, well, there must be a book out there already called sales pitch. So I can't call it that. But then when I Googled around and went on Amazon, it turns out there is no book called sales pitch. So I was like, oh, well, that's what mine's going to be. 10 years from now, somebody else will be writing a book about this stuff and say, oh, darn, I can't call it sales pitch because April already took that one. Again, I hope that people find this as like interesting and, and useful. Like the same thing with the first book. I didn't want to write a book that was a neat idea. I didn't want people to read the book and come in and say, Oh, that was really good, you know? And you know, the first time I had somebody say my book was really good the last time around, my spontaneous response was, you know, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And then I was like, wait a minute, I don't actually care if you enjoy it, <laughs> which sounds terrible, but it's true. I, I don't want you to have fun with it. I want you to do something with it. I want you to be, I want it to be useful. And so the first book wasn't just about the idea of positioning. It was about getting it done. This book is the same thing. It's not about the idea of doing sales. It's not about how we're doing objection handling or moving a deal along or how we build rapport with a client or anything of like that, which I think your sales people are probably pretty good at already. This is solving the problem of we're going to build a sales pitch from scratch. We need a structure. That sales pitch should reflect our positioning. Our positioning should be an input to the sales pitch. So if I have great positioning, how do I translate that into a sales pitch? That is the problem this book is designed to solve. So that's it. It's available finally. Oh my God, it took years to get it out. And so now it's available. You can go and on Amazon and Google up my name, April Dunford, or Google up the name of the book itself. It's called Sales Pitch. And that's I'm the only one with a book called that. So you'd be able to find it on my website. If you go to aprildunford.com slash books, there's also some goodies. So I made a bunch of templates. And if you read Obviously Awesome, a lot of people like the templates. There was a positioning canvas and a bunch of other things that you could download off the website. I've done a complete overhaul of the positioning templates that I had before. They kind of look the same, but I think they're improved based on the stuff that I've learned in the last three, four years of people using those templates. And then I've added the sales pitch templates onto that. So you now get the one Mambo set of templates to help you do the positioning and then translate that positioning into a sales pitch. That's aprilunford.com slash books. And if you go there, you'll see a spot where you can download the templates. There'll also be links there to where you can find the book on Amazon or anywhere else you want to buy books. It's there too. There's physical books and eBooks. You're going to ask me, what about the audio book? And I'm going to say, I'm getting there, man, but it's not there yet. <laughs> it's coming in a couple of months. And if you listen to this podcast or follow me on LinkedIn or anywhere else, or sign up for my newsletter, you will be the first to know when that audio book is available. I'm so excited to have this thing out. I'm so glad. Thank you as always for joining me on this journey. And if you do decide to buy the book, give me some feedback. I'd love to know what you think about it. And I really hope that people find it useful. Anyways, that's it for this week. We'll go back to our regular scheduled programming next week. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll talk to you next week.